Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. This is the biological century, believes David Relman. He is professor for medicine and microbiology at Stanford University. Relman has conducted research on infectious diseases and has advised the U.S. government on future biological threats. In his talk, he explains how research in the life sciences today is very different from how it used to be. One example is digitalization. Over the course of the coming years, more and more robotic devices will carry out lab work. These machines piece together the steps of an experiment, and in order to do so, they have to follow a code. A code that has been written by a scientist. But not necessarily by someone nearby. The location where the experiment takes place thus becomes independent of the location of the person who came up with the code. The experiment can also be carried out multiple times and at multiple places. All that is needed is that the script be transmitted to the machines. This new way of doing laboratory work in the life sciences is basically a good thing, Relman says, but it comes with new risks. What are we supposed to do in this situation? David Relman pleads for scaled governance and oversight, self-governance, local and regional governance, and larger oversights. Some experiments, he says, are so risky that they should not be carried out at all. David Relman gave his talk on December 12, 2014 in Hanover, Germany, at the Herrenhausen Symposium, Dual Use Research on Microbes, Biosafety, Biosecurity, Responsibility. The symposium was organized by the Volkswagen Foundation. The title of Relman's talk is The Moral and Ethical Responsibilities of Life Scientists. Um, where I come from, I, I, I was trained initially as a clinician. What motivates me is wanting to help people maintain health and restore health. Um, I certainly, as a part-time clinician, um, think a lot about making sure that, um, that first I do no harm. Uh, but I'm also a scientist, and I actually spend most of my day running a lab, and I love science. I am one of the most unabashed supporters of science. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I certainly recognize that the questions we're talking about here are difficult. They will not be answered um, by us or those in this room or by any of us sometime soon. Um, I did want to give a few contextual comments, though, about how we might go about discussing these issues. These are um, amazing times in science, and a little of that has been already um, described, so I want to just make a few other observations about that. Uh, Michael and others have also alluded to this question, um, nature or man, and I sometimes resist getting into questions of that sort because I'm not sure that it's um, a useful construct, but I actually now think that there may be a, a purpose in asking this. Um, I also am reluctant to ever talk about motivations, but of course, we all are motivated by, by um, experiences and background and who we are and influences and role models. And I think that may actually be an important issue as well. And, and that leads me to um, a very, perhaps superficial um, discussion of morality and, and then ways forward. Uh, I think a lot of you understand what this means. Uh, I was born just at the beginning of this revolution, I began to appreciate it in college um, and university, but it's now responsible perhaps for defining our time, and I think globally. This is the, the biologic century, as Gregory Benford, the futurist, has, has called it. Um, a lot goes on, and, and it's hard sometimes to capture you know, what it means. Sometimes we focus on tools rather than concepts, but this is a slide that came out of a study some years ago at the National Academies of Science, and um, this was an effort to try to organize our thinking about what's happening in the life sciences. And these four categories, we thought, uh, captured a lot of, of at least the tool building. First, that there are now some amazingly powerful ways of generating diversity 
And of course, you, you know, we, we say diversity that may not have ever existed in nature, but of course we can't know that. We're actually not very good at surveying diversity in nature, even with today's tools, and we could come back to that. But nonetheless, I think there are some experiments that suggest that we do know how to make kinds of things that probably were strongly disfavored in their natural uh, place of origin, but now have a chance to, to live and propagate because of laboratory conditions. We uh, know how to direct design of, of life forms. Uh, we know how to understand and manipulate. We seek to understand, certainly. And then we have ways, of course, of delivering and trying to make useful some of these um, tools for all kinds of, of useful purposes. And one of the little you know, bits of capability that comes out of a, a large suite of tools is, is this, um, which is relevant here and has already been, been mentioned. I, I certainly believe strongly that um, how we use these tools can have immense, immense, profound benefit. And there's so many examples one could pick. Um, this might be a relevant one here. Um, we certainly uh, can do things more quickly, more efficiently, but also kinds of things that, that one couldn't have really thought about seriously just 20 years ago. Here's an example of the synthetic creation of a virus that that Ralph Barrick and Mark Dennison believe may have existed in the past, but don't propose to, 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 to be extant today. But it's, a, it's an inferred ancestral state from a phylogenetic reconstruction of today's coronaviruses. They actually made this hypothetical ancestral virus, and it does replicate in tissue culture cells in the laboratory and behave as one might have predicted. So now, again, getting to the comment about resurrecting retroviruses, this is a really profoundly interesting, important capability, and one which has greatly informed our understanding of history of these viruses. These tools are used incredibly often today under commercial um, sort of with, because of commercial drivers and because of commercial purposes. And, and these are just two of many examples of how diversity creation or directed design has led to useful kinds of, of vi viruses, in this case, uh, for purposes that you can understand from the titles, but also from the way in which the selection was imposed. So I think one of the lessons here is that one often does get what one selects for, and that by understanding selective pressures in the laboratory, we do have a means of anticipating some of the results that we, um, that we generate in our laboratories. So this is getting to a point that I want to try to make clear, which is we shouldn't think that all science is just one big, wonderful um, experiment in which we really don't know what will happen. Um, that's really not the case usually. We do think we understand what the goals will, you know, goals are certainly, and what the result may be. And when we think more carefully and look exactly at selective pressures, that's when you have a better predictive understanding of what may arise. Now, of course, we're often wrong, but certainly not in all cases. Here is a deliberate design of something that has immense value. This is a yeast strain that makes artemisinin. Unfortunately, um, it took so long to make this that um, at the time it was started, there was no artemisinin resistance that there now is. But this is an incredibly powerful um, example of what can be done when previously the only source of this drug was, of course, the, um, uh, the uh, sweet wormwood tree. Here's another yeast. This one was just recently described last month by actually by friends and colleagues of mine at Stanford. Um, this is a yeast that makes opiates, morphine. Uh, and semi-synthetic opiates. This was done again for well-intentioned purposes, although I've heard some people um, describe, describe this as um, baking bad rather than breaking bad. It's a yeast, you know, get it, bread. Um, a lot of this is now very easy, which has lowered the, the, um, 
the uh, threshold to access. So a lot of these sorts of technologies are packaged in little kits. And here's one for you know, CRISPR-Cas endonucleases, homing endonucleases. And now um, there is the means to perhaps deliberately drive to extinction a life species, uh, a species, a mosquito, using this technology, again, intended for good. Um, but you think about the, the profound sort of importance of being able to do this. Um, here's another beneficial result of the use of uh, homing and nucleases, genome editing in humans. But think about the power of that. Here's where things start to get interesting, I think. Not only is the information that has led to all of this work digitalized, but the procedures have become uh, digital scripts. These are algorithms that are written now so that increasingly robotic devices will do these procedures and piece together steps in a experimental uh, protocol. Um, here's a company that not only builds you liquid handling robots and other robotic uh, devices, but helps you design software that will write basically an experiment into code. And now you can outsource your experiment. You don't have to actually do it in your lab. You can send the script to these um, uh, for-profit commercial research organizations, which will run your experiment on their robots with your code. So, what does this all mean? And this, of course, has been always true for contract clinical research. This is now true for contract scientific research. What this means is that we're talking about immense benefits, but also risks that now lie at and wherever the code is used, as well as where it is written. It's not now just the site of origin of the idea and the physical experiment, it's wherever it becomes conducted, which could be in increasingly many different kinds of places. The effort is now distributed. An experiment doesn't take place in one place. When we start thinking about this traditional paradigm of how science is done, this is all changing. Now you may say, this doesn't look like science in my institute, but I would submit to you that if not next year or the year after, that 10 years from now or 15 years from now, this is the world that we will live in. And, um, and that will be by and large a good thing, but a world in which we now need to think about what does risk and benefit mean and for whom and how do we undertake discussions of this sort in that sort of setting. And that means governance and oversight must be equally distributed. They must be scalable. And I don't think we have thought about how to scale Gov we first don't have a good governance system right now for, for life sciences. Um, and when I say governance, I mean both self and local and larger organizations. We certainly don't know how to scale that when we figure it out yet. This question, um, the reason I think it's important, and Michael actually raised this in a way that made me think about it. If we are to conclude that say nature not only has been, and that's certainly true, but always will be um, far more capable than, than we could ever be. It means, I think, that for some people we stop worrying about what humans are capable of doing. And maybe I'm over-interpreting, but I just want to make clear, I don't think we know the answer to that, and I would argue that the answer is changing. So this is just one of many, many experiments I could show you where someone actually thought that they were attenuating uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, actually for the purpose of understanding this interesting operon that governs intracellular replication uh, of, of TB in, t in, in macrophages. But here the result was unexpected, and it's because they didn't recognize at the time that there are a class of genes, not only in bacteria, but in all life forms, that some have now called hypervirulence genes. This is nature's way of attenuating an infectious agent. It doesn't make sense for an infectious agent to replicate so quickly or be so virulent that it will kill its host quickly before the host allows the organism to propagate and, and disseminate. So nature attenuates organisms with these genes. We're now discovering them. And what this experiment says is that as we begin to understand 
attenuation. We understand how to relieve attenuation. We understand how to make hypervirulent organisms, both in sort of in pseudo natural means, but also from the ground up. And I think this then means that when we think about success, our success, would we to be you know, malevolent versus that of nature? Um, we're using the wrong criteria. If we use long-term evolutionary time-like criteria, of course, uh, we think that nature is, has figured out long-term adaptation much better than we understand it today. But if the criteria are short-term success of an infectious agent, several you know, years worth of propagation, and um, an imbalance between replication in a host and outcome of the host, where the host dies, well, you could say that if one's purpose were to cause death and disease, we understand how to do that sort of thing, I think, unfortunately, um, even though it has no long-term real success uh, strategy implications for, for these microbes. So all I'm saying is that we should be very cautious about making conclusions about who knows better how to make or design X, Y, or Z. I, th I think that calculus is changing. We also, of course, have talked about this, but um, if we're going to worry, uh, you know, it depends on, on who you are as a person and how you were raised and how you see the world and is the glass half full or empty, that sort of thing. Um, we need to remember that there's a whole heterogeneous mixed population of possible scenarios. There are people who have all kinds of different views on the world, of ways they operate. They certainly aren't necessarily bad people. They simply may do things which, for the sake of others, have perhaps untoward consequences. So here's my very sort of suggested with humility set of motivations for scientists. I think, certainly, the vast majority of us wish to generate useful knowledge. Um, and we do so largely because we'd like to see society benefited. That's absolutely, I think, true. But it doesn't explain everything. And it certainly doesn't explain a large segment of activity in the sciences when you leave these sorts of rooms. Because there's certainly a lot of idle curiosity. I and mean, you have to be honest with yourself, I certainly have idle curiosity about what makes something tick or what might happen if one did X. We're certainly, if you're honest with yourself, driven by fame, and we're driven by fortune as well. I, if any of you have ever been to bio, bio is the big global biotechnology meeting each year. Um, this was the 2011 meeting. There's an interesting um, banner here. Um, and I, I, I put this up here because it's a pretty striking statement. I don't know if you can read this. Our only agenda is the success of the industry. That's the, the world's largest biotechnology organization, bio. Now, I'm not criticizing that. I understand the value of economics and financial drivers. But we have to be honest, this is a major reason why some science and technology is generated and used. And it's a, it's a different sort of mindset. But when we sit here in our little academic discussions, we lose sight of the fact that a large amount of, of science is now being done under those contexts. So we have the growing power of an individual. We have drivers that are very diverse across the globe that are not like what we know in our institutes and universities and think tanks and councils and government bodies. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to, again, I am not attempting to, you know, to sell you fear, Michael, at all. I just think this is a, an observation about the world. Um, there are a lot of people, and hacking in my community, in the Silicon Valley, is a positive thing, okay? So hacking is good. But we have biohackers, and uh, we have do-it-yourselfers, and we have all kinds of people who are doing science for lots and lots of different reasons. And I'm simply saying... This means that the nature of risk is very different today and certainly tomorrow than it was yesterday. Now, Michael has said, what can we do about this, all right? Um, and I'm gonna get to that in just a sec. Some of you may disagree. Um, misuse simply 
it hasn't happened. It's unlikely to happen. Why should we spend time worrying? Let's just get on with the, the good stuff. Um, maybe just to, to make this point again, I don't know how likely this is. It's certainly going to be this intersection between um, those that are either irresponsible or, you know, or, or ignorant or ill-intended and those that are capable. It's this little space here. Maybe there is very little space right in there right now. But I will tell you one thing that I think is true for sure. Tomorrow and next year, it's bigger. So this, what better time to talk about scenarios than today and anticipation of this inevitable phenomenon. So what do we have to sort of fall back upon? I think, you know, much has been said about the, the origins and history of moral and ethical principles. I am not an expert in this. I, I simply know what I feel and what I have read and what I hear from lots and lots of other people. When one thinks about the kinds of principles that ought to guide our behavior as humans on this planet, let alone as scientists or policymakers or whatever else, I think it ought to be driven by these five principles shown here. Public beneficence. You maximize public benefits, minimize public harm. Responsible stewardship, and that means thinking about the future because we're talking about stewardship of the planet. Intellectual freedom and responsibility that go hand in hand. Democratic deliberation. How do we, and we just heard a wonderful talk about the collective action. How do we have collaborative decision making um, and remember that it's going to have to be iterative. We're not going to get this right or even find a solution when we begin, but we must begin now and we must continue this and continue to work hard at improving it. And how do we make it deliberative? Um, how do we make th this whole consideration just and fair for all on this planet? There are a lot of people who would love to say something at this meeting. They're not here. Every time I get in a taxi and someone says, well, what are you doing here uh, in this city you know, or wherever you are, I, I try to explain the meeting. And if it happens to be about this, I try to be as objective as I can. And most taxi drivers have something very useful to say about this. And they're not here today. So on behalf of taxi drivers, we need to think not just about our, our, sir, our earnest interest in generating benefits that will be widely distributed, but we have to think about the burdens, the risks that we have asked them to bear today if we are talking about something that has the potential for being highly transmissible. It's everybody that ex must accept that risk in the quest for benefits that we think will happen sometime. So I would also just emphasize that I know it used to be said, and it was argued in French philosophy and many other disciplines, that there is this bright distinction between the quest for pure knowledge and the, the, the effort to apply knowledge, and that we apply different standards. That, is, that can't be true anymore. There is, I don't see any bright line between the two today. Everything that is basic, even the, the quest to understand black holes, has applications in relevance and, and uh, translatability to and implications for daily life and for the lives of people. So morality must be, a, you know, must be a consideration in ethics. Michael Sandel's written a wonderful book about justice. Justice, in his words, justice involves cultivating virtue and reasoning about the common good. We are very bad, especially in the United States, at thinking of, about the common good. Um, herd immunity is about the common good. We're pretty bad about talking about the importance of herd immunity and what it means to, to vaccinate for the common good, not just for me. And, and then there are some very interesting examples and lessons we can take from other kinds of science in the past. And this Joseph Rotblat, many of you may know of him or his writings, but you can read what he said. This is something that's a lesson for our times today. We're often too busy to stop and have these kinds of discussions, but uh, I think that's a tragedy. So just a last few set of questions to get to some of the topics here. Are there experiments that should not be undertaken because the risks outweigh the benefits or because the benefits will only be realized in the indefinite future, while as the risks are born today? Um, 
what is the nature of this contract that I believe is, is truly you know, established between us and the rest of the society? Well, my answer to the first is yes, there are experiments that ought not to be undertaken. And it's not questions that shouldn't be asked. It's experiments that ought not to be undertaken. And it's because, actually, I think there are alternative approaches that make a lot of sense, which together get us close to what might have been learned with the one in question, which has untoward risk. Um, and yes, there is a profound uh, moral contract, and we could talk about more about that. So here's my, I think, pretty much my last slide. How do you, how do you approach these, these issues? Well, some have said, why not regulate access to reagents, information, other kinds of critical materials? This was a useful strategy in the nuclear science realm. I just don't think this makes practical sense, and I think we generally agree. Um, does this deserve more conversation? Yes. I'm not being dismissive. I just want to be, you know, put my point of view here. The other things I think are all equally value, valuable, and no one of them alone is going to solve our problem. But together they have added, additive, maybe even complementary or synergistic value. Self-governance, other kinds of governance regimes. I've already mentioned, I don't think we have good models right now. We life scientists have been, um, have been lax, and I think um, simply uh, ignorant of our responsibilities in finding a, a better governance systems for ourselves. And if we don't do that, as you know, we will have something imposed. Um, this also needs to be local as well as regional. Um, there needs to be an effort to think forward, ahead, anticipate that stewardship issue. Um, and then we have to be, of course, realistic and, and understand not only will we fail in preventing someone from doing something silly or unfortunate or reprehensible even, but certainly there will be, continue to be these events in nature. And, and for all those reasons, we should be working much harder on, on public health infrastructure and many other things that you all know and work on yourselves. So um, I don't think we have answers for these, um, but these are the sorts of things that we should be thinking about. Some have said, what about Asilomar? Asilomar is a wonderful idea. Um, the actual reality of Asilomar wouldn't work today, but you know, virtual, repeated, iterative kinds of Asilomar-like events, absolutely. People have talked, like, talked about an Asilomar-like process, and, and that's certainly a, a, a good aspirational goal. So um, I will end with this slide. Risks are here to stay. And in fact, we're going to face more and more of these things. We cannot simply wish them away. We must commit to ongoing conversation and relationship building and trust. Um, we have obligations. I feel this very strongly. I also feel that not all interesting experiments um, should be undertaken. Um, there are plenty of interesting experiments. Um, some have much greater risks than others. Why not pick the latter? Um, and then mitigating risks, I've already spoken about this. I, I will stop here and be happy if we have time for, for a conversation about this. Thank you. <laughs>